Hey guys, so I got my door open, as y'all can see, and we're going to see if we can make through chapter 19 before somebody comes in, but I'm the only one back here, so I've been, you know, getting visitors, so I need to make sure I can see who's coming back here. So let's talk about chapter 19. That's the school age child. I believe that these are some fun little people. They like to party all the time. Um, they're very interactive. They're learning so much. So let's talk about what some general characteristics of these school age people are. They're normally between the ages of six and 12. They are more engrossed in facts than fantasy. They wanna know what's really going on, what's the real deal, Holyfield. They do not want your fiction all the time. Even though they may still deal in fiction a little bit or fantasy, they, they want to know facts, you know, what's going on. They develop first close peer relationships outside of their family group because they're going to school. And then they may have a homegirl there. Her name is Cynthia. And she has the cutest lip glosses. And that's my best friend. Okay. They are often judged by their performance. Got a lot to say about that. Um, and their sense of industry and development of positive self-esteem directly influenced by their peer group. So let's talk about it. Now, um, uh, we said that they are more fact-driven than fantasy-driven. We know that. We know why. Because, you know, they want to know what's kind of really going on. Um, they want the truth. Um, but let's talk about um, situations in which school age children might be judged by their peers based on their performance. So it's as quick and easy as this. They know which kids they think are good at a sport or good at their fine art or, you know, all this kind of stuff. They know who they think is good at it. Um, and then they know who they think is not good at it, which is why I always say Put your kids in all kind of sports. Put them in all kind of fine arts. Make sure that they know how to read and they do good in school because they're going to find their niche because it is so closely tied to self-esteem. They have to be good at something. If you only put them, let's just say, you only put them in basketball and, and baby, that's not their calling. Their self-esteem is tied to that. Like they're not good at their sport. You see what I'm saying? So it's um, a direct... Um, thought for them on how they're doing according to what their peers think. And so let's talk about in what ways would a school age child exhibit some Erickson stage of industry. All right. Now, this is becoming um, good at their fine art or their sport. And if they do not, they may demonstrate some inferiority um, per the Erickson's stage of industry. And we don't want these little people to feel inferior. Let me tell y'all something. People don't realize that self-esteem is starting to be built very, very early on in their life. They do not need to be just sitting around, playing on their games, sitting around, you know, not doing things because then their self-esteem is tied to that. They feel like they don't, they can't do anything, you know, or they're not good at stuff. So, now let's go ahead and talk about other characteristics like um, we talked about Erickson's. Um, let's talk about um, a couple of others. So let's talk about Freud. Freud's stage of sexual latency. Now during this time, that just means that the children are identifying more with the same sex parent um, than before during this age category. And with the um, P against concrete operations, uh, this is the acceptance of home and school will affect their attitude and their role in life, okay, and their self-esteem. So it's very important that we give them adequate um, things to do to be good at and then express to them how good they are at these said things. Now let's talk about their physical growth. Now. Um, their growth will start to slow down um, just before puberty. They may get some weight gain, uh, which is another reason they should be active. Um, and then they will get more rapid increase in height. Now, their brain has reached the approximate adult size and their muscular coordination is much improved from preschool and toddler. 
and they have a lower center of gravity at that time. Now, also, it's very important to note that size is not correlated with emotional maturity. And people make this mistake all the time. You know how you'll see some kids, and the kids are like five years old, right? The kids are like five years old, and you have one kid who's a five-year-old, and he's a big old kid. And he's doing the same thing like the rest of the five-year-olds, pushing and, you know, running and all that. And then someone may say, hey, hey, you too big for that. Don't do this or don't do that. You know, um, don't do this, don't do that. You know, you should know better. Why, because he's bigger? That, that is what the school of thought is on that. And we should not. Jeez. We should not. Now let's talk about some sex education. Now sex education or sex ed is a lifelong process for everybody. For people who don't think so, you're, you're mistaken, okay? Um, sex ed should be age appropriate from the time that they feel like that, that the parent or the caregiver feels like they can understand. Um, they have some accomplished, they have accomplished less by talking or formal instruction than by a whole uh, climate of the home. They may also have questions that should be answered as simply as possible. The correct names of genitalia should also be used, but we must note that, you know, um, it is not a punishable thing if you note know that the school age child is having a little bit of private uh, masturbation. It's something that they might do a little bit. Not to say that you don't correct it, but also that you don't shame it. Okay? Now, when, like, like there's a question um, of, you know, uh, telling them too much or not telling them enough. Let's just talk about like babies. Like, okay, so a school age child come to you and they're like, where babies come from? No longer can you say, oh, the stork brings them. I never told my kids that. But you can no longer say the stork brings them. That is fantasy child. They're not trying to hear that. They know better. But then also, you don't want to give them some long explanation of the egg and the sperm and the, all of this. You know, they, that, that's too much. They don't understand all that. But you do have to give them an explanation of where babies actually come from. You know, uh, depending on the age of the child, you can st explain to them how the baby got there you know, age appropriately and how the baby's going to be born because if their mama is pregnant, they're going to want to know how that baby got in there. Point blank period. We don't have time for your games. What happened? That's, that's what they're going to want to know, child, and they ain't got time for your shenanigans. Okay, and then let's talk about some gender identity. Now, sex roles influenced by the parents or their uh, close caregivers and the differential treatment and identification like in the family and in society, they're going to start to notice that. The influence of school environment, uh, like aggressive behaviors, um, they understand that aggressive behaviors may be more acceptable for a boy than for a girl, or they may be, they may understand that timid behaviors are more, accept more acceptable from a girl than a boy, you know, and we, we need to really work on that as a society. Um, but they're going to notice the influences and sometimes they do pick it up from school environments and the incorporation of traditional masculine and feminine positive attributes may lead to further human functioning for this particular child. So unfortunately, like I said, you know, a boy that may display some timidness behavior. He may be ridiculed. They may be like, oh, you're acting like a baby, you know, or, um, oh, don't act like a little girl. Like, we should never say those things. Or if the little girl is acting aggressive, you know, then it's very, it's frowned upon, you know, but little, her, little Jimmy was doing the same thing. You know, she doesn't understand the difference, but we expect her to be like a little princess and all this kind of stuff when we really should do some uh androgynous uh concepts for these little people you know um so not so much on what their gender is but the action that they are doing that's what we need to be more concerned about and then approach that as so okay 
Now let's talk about STIs, sexually transmitted infections. Now education on how to prevent STIs and HIV and AIDS should be presented in a very simple term for them. And factual and concrete information is essential uh, component for these children. Now the facts concerning harmful uh, effects of drugs and unprotected sex should be communicated and educated to the child without scare tactics. Let me tell you what I mean by scare tactics. You know, um, like telling a child if someone, you know, if you let someone touch you in your, let's use a, a word that ain't right, um, because we should teach them the proper language, uh, your private parts, your no-no area, your, your you know, uh, your purse, all this that the people call it instead of the real name, child. That just really grinds my gears. Um, then you're going to get sick and you're going to die. Now, first of all, you done lied. Second of all, you did not give them any power. Third of all, they don't know what you're talking about. Okay, so then the, the concept can be misconstrued when if you give them the proper information, then they can digest that information and use it appropriately because so many times people don't know the proper names, they don't know what's going on, and mis or, or uneducated people harm themselves on accident because they just don't know. And like I said, these ages are not too young to give them some uh, education. It just must be age appropriate um, because... Like I told y'all, the youngest girl I ever delivered was 13 years old. She got pregnant when she was 12. On her own, you know, and, and she let me know, like, she participated. She was not touched like I originally thought. But there I was speculating, you know. It still wasn't okay, but I'm just telling you. Um, School-related tasks. Parents and children um, should set realistic goals and the development of heightened awareness and things such as attendance problems, tardiness, and signs of loneliness or depression need to be um, you know, dealt with right away. And it should continue to be encouraged to children to discuss any school problems, uh, worries, or feelings because they can uh, misinterpret information. Homework is the responsibility of the child. Homework is not the responsibility of the parent doing it for them. But it is the responsibility of the parent to help teach the child to get through the homework. You know what I'm saying? And not badger the child or scare the child or torture the child that you're going to spank them if they can't tell you what's two plus two. You know what I'm saying? If Johnny has two apples and then Sally has two apples. How many apples did they both bring to the picnic together? All of this kind of mess. Like, help these children through that. But let's talk about some of these other heightened awareness and things that should be dealt with. Like these tardies and absences. They do affect the child, even though they are not the ones in control of getting themselves to school. It's a huge deal, and it affects them because of the... Uh, education system and the teacher and what's going on and if they're getting their homework turned in on time or if they're getting zeros because they're not getting the bell ringers done all of these things affect the child and the parent needs to understand that instead of just saying like whatever excuse child the parent gonna come up with in those five minutes okay now, I feel like it's very responsible for the parent when it's time to do homework. Like, let's have Woosad from the day, because mama and daddy might have had a bad day. Child might have had a bad day. Somebody might have had a bad day. We need to Woosad from the day, teach the parent that, before you start this homework. Okay? Or make sure put some, they got their snack before they start the homework. That snack time going to give you time to, you know, let leave your little nine to five outside or, or in your study until it's time for you to deal with that but it gives you everybody time to calm down so that you're not super abrasive to your child now let's talk about mental physical uh and emotional and social development the six-year-old child let's start with talking about them so for the six-year-old child they're very energetic they're on the go they like to uh start tasks but they may not always complete the task they may need help you know completing their task um they talk for a uh, purpose rather than for the sake of talking 
they have some vocabulary consistent with about 2,500 words. Baby, they is talking, talking, talking. They require about 11 to 13 hours of sleep per night. So here's the thing. Letting these children just stay up to stay up because they want to stay up is not good for them. It is more harmful than good. And so it's very important that they have their rest. But now let's talk about all those things for the seven-year-old child. They, they set very high standards for themselves. They have a good sense of humor. Uh, they're more modest when they get about that age. And they may enjoy uh, being active, but also enjoy their time for rest, honey. They, they feel like they need that. But that modesty, they start exhibiting that like around seven years of age. Let's move on to the eight-year-old. So, like, uh, the eight-year-old, they want to do everything, honey, baby. They, they, they feel like they're miniature grown people. They want to do everything. They can play along for a longer amount of time. They are very creative. They enjoy a group, a good group activity, honey, and they behave better for company than for the family because, baby, they, they know what you're going to do, but they want to impress these other people, all right? Uh, and they uh, have a hero worship evident. Now, the nine-year-old little people, they are dependable. They show more interest in family activities. They assume more responsibilities. They're more likely to complete a task now at this age category. Um, they're more able to accept criticism for their action. They understand it a little bit better. And they have worries and mild uh, compulsions are very, very common. We're going to stop there and then we're going to continue.